So he came to Imperial to do a part-time PhD, and we started the collaboration on the design of the programming language, and in particular, the type systems. And we developed also the, the models that talk about the various uh, garbage collection algorithms that I'm going to present tomorrow. In 2013, one of our uh, MSE students, Sebastian, uh, joined uh, the team and he wrote, he wrote a distributed a library that worked uh, uh, with uh, uh, other library, with, uh, the, with a given library to offer uh, distribution. And also Sebastian was extremely optimistic about the whole idea and he said, we have to make a programming language, we have to raise capital, uh, and we will be able to convince uh, people that uh, this is going to be a wonderful programming language. We will be able to convince people that they need to write stuff in our programming language. We will be selling software written in our programming language. Uh, and then at some point we will be just a, a company dedicated to uh, our, our programming language. Um, so he was very... Uh, um, uh, enthusiastic about it and uh, he convinced us all that this was a wonderful idea. So we raised the ca capital and in 2014 we made the company. We started in July 2014 and already in October 2014 we had the compiler. So that was wow! That was a, an extremely fast uh, and uh, impressive result and we were super happy with that. In 2015, we open sourced it. Uh, we started some uh, um, talks about it, but uh, uh, it was also very impressive. We, uh, uh, Sylvan got uh, invited to speak at various uh, venues. Uh, lots of people were interested in the programming language, and we ran some little trials at a big financial institution and some uh, middle enterprises and the results were super good. Very, very fast, very much better than uh, existing application, much easier to develop, uh, days of development versus of months of development. So we thought we had made it and we were extremely happy. But uh, nobody wanted to be the first to sign any kind of contract uh, with us. At the time, we also got quite a support from the community. Jan helped us, uh, uh, Doug Lee, um, Gilad Bracha and Laurie also helped us with uh, making suggestions, making introductions. Uh, there was always a phase of, uh, of euphoria where we thought, OK, this next step, this next endeavor will bring it. The uh, 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 language was adopted informally by uh, developers. But they did not want to sign any kind of contract. So in the end, we folded. The Pony community keeps growing. And uh, Sylvan, by now, is working at uh, Microsoft uh, Research, working, perhaps I should say, what he's working on afterwards, and uh, also working quite a lot on Pony in his uh, free time. So like everything in life, it is a mixed uh, story. It's uh, perhaps a sad story for uh, our company and it's a very exciting story for the programming language development. So what are the features in our language? We have got actors and objects. Um, uh, we can pass uh, messages and messages pass mutable state without requiring any kind of copying. So passing of messages is cheap because the type system makes sure that uh, it is uh, uh, safe and we, can, we don't need to copy when we pass. We have got static types, everything is type safe. There are no null values, uh, means no null pointer exception. Capabilities are at the heart of the type system, exceptions as are checked. We have pattern matching, lambdas, partial applications, traits and interfaces, so that gives us both nominal and structural subtypes and types union intersection types, generics in the style of F-bounded polymorphism, uh, some interesting uh, ways of, um, of reading data, which is uh, uh, consuming and destructive reads out of data structures. And this is reflected in the type system, a CFFI. There is a small and, lo and growing library. So what I'm going to talk about today is only parts of the language. I'm going to talk about actors, 
about causal message delivery capabilities and atomicity, genetics and termination. And tomorrow I will be talking about garbage collection. So first actors, uh, as um, S uh, Tobias uh, said already yesterday, it is based on the actor model that was uh, proposed by Carl Hewitt, and Gulag uh, was the first to make a programming language based on these ideas. There are several actor-based programming languages. I think Erlang is uh, the most widely known, and uh, uh, it is a functional programming language, or at least functional most of the times. And, uh, um, ACA is a library based on Scala, which provides the actor paradigm. There, are, there is also Encor, which is the language that uh, Tobias spoke about yesterday, and Pony I'm going to talk about today. So what is uh, the actor paradigm as in Pony? There are some variations, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm just going to describe it as it is in Pony. The actor is an active object. It's an object in the sense that it has got uh, processing capability and uh, it has a local state, and it is active in the sense that it runs asynchronously with other actors. The, the actors can send asynchronous messages to other actors. Um, the messages are stored in queues, and when an actor is scheduled, then he executes the first message that is in his queue. And they send synchronous messages to objects or synchronous messages to themselves. So the asynchronous stuff is called the behavior, and the synchronous stuff is called the function. So here is an example, uh, the first example we are uh, looking at, which, uh, uh, where we have got uh, an actor main. If you look at uh, the code in the um, Dropbox that uh, I shared with you, it is in uh, the directory called one actors, ABC pony. So, I'm going to just show it to you, run through it a bit. So I have got uh, a main actor, the main actor, ah, ha, huh. what do I do? I think that's too complicated to do now. I'll have to give up on that. Right, thank you. So you see that we have got a, a main actor and uh, uh, the keyword new indicates. Ah. Thanks. Okay, so there is a main actor and it ha has got a constructor that is called create. The constructor takes an argument environment. This is the actor that has input and output. And uh, what the main actor does is it creates uh, five other actors which are of type act. Act is defined here. Uh, it gives them, it calls their constructor and some uh, data that will be used in, uh, for uh, random number generation. And then it runs for quite a while poking each of the actors in uh, their turn. And uh, the actor act has got uh, uh, a constructor new that tells me how to initialize, how to uh, uh, create the new actor. It has a, func a behavior that means an asynchronous uh, uh, behavior, poke, which uh, uh, lets the actor wait for a while and then print his name. And here is uh, the function to do busy waiting. Uh, so that's not, uh, uh, that's a, a pretty fundamental and small program just to show us the, um, 
just to show uh, how actors uh, uh, work. So when we f run uh, create, what happens is the, the create uh, um, function uh, creates uh, these th three actors here, A, B, C, and uh, um, I'm using this representation, the rounded boxes to indicate actors, the line underneath to indicate their lifetime, and these uh, square boxes to indicate when they are executing some uh, uh, behavior or some function. So here, the actor is uh, uh, running the, the create method and he's creating the other actors. Okay, so the next point to discuss is uh, causality, causal message delivery. So we look a little bit more in the, in the code. And I said that um, the actors act themselves have got a, a, a behavior where they are printing their name. So when, I, when main, sorry, and uh, the main actor has got a behavior where he pokes the three actors. So when I am running run in main or when main runs run, then he will be sending poke to each of the actors and at some point this actor is going to take poke out of his queue and execute it, then this takes it out of the queue and execute it, then this one. So this is one possible execution, but it is also possible to think that uh, the actor, uh, uh, that the thread that is running the actor does something else in between, um, or stops working, or whatever. So it's also possible to think that uh, while they are executing, they stop their local execution for a while and uh, resume. And also, is it possible that things happen in that order, that B executes first, and then C starts, and then A starts? And it is possible, even if the messages were to arrive in the order A, B, C, nothing precludes in what order the messages are going to be taken off the queue. And also, it is possible that uh, even though uh, main sends his message to A first, the message arrives at the queue uh, of A last. Nothing uh, uh, precludes this, uh, or is taken off the queue la last. Nothing precludes this from happening. What cannot be is that an actor behaves, uh, executes two behaviors in parallel the actors are sequential in their own uh, world. This is something that uh, our core and its extensions uh, are supporting and is not supported in Pony. So there is a couple of, a lot of uncertainty when I'm writing my program because I don't know in what orders, uh, sorry, I don't know when I am writing my own code for the green actor, for instance, I don't know what will the other actors do while I'm executing. I don't know well, they, when they will take uh, messages off their queues, and I don't know when the messages will be delivered. So that in, looks as if there is a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty, and uh, uh, which would make the programming uh, difficult. But there are two things that alleviate uncertainty. One is types, and the, the other is causal message delivery. So types. We're going to see it later, but what it, the types do is that they give me the certainty that uh, when a message is taken off the queue, all the state that is interesting to me, to the current actor, will not change unless I change it. In fact, the guarantee is even stronger. When a message uh, is sent to my queue, all the state that is accessible from that uh, queue will not change until I receive uh, the message and I, the actor, start changing it. So that makes it simpler to think about code. And the other uncertainty is about the order of uh, message sent and delivery. But uh, here we have got uh, causality to help us. So we are talking of causality, but uh, perhaps uh, um, the term is not that good. Uh, logically precede describes it better. Still, the literature talks about causality, so I'm going to talk about causality. Um, so what causality says is that the messages are arrive at queues in causal order. What is causal? If I receive a message M and then I send M prime, then M caused M prime. That m kind of makes sense. But also, if I send a message and then send M prime, then M caused the, the next message. 
So it is about what has to uh, precede uh, the other one. And causality is transitive. So there is another example in, uh, uh, in the Dropbox. I'm not going to show it to you in detail. You can run it afterwards. We have got uh, uh, an actor customer who has got access to a store and uh, a bank. So these let statements say these are constants. They are not going to change. And I have a, a behavior run which decides uh, what is the price of something, then tells the bank to give me credit for the particular uh, price and uh, tells the store to buy the thing for the particular price. And uh, the store actor uh, knows about the, the bank. And um, when it is asked by a customer to, uh, to buy something for a certain price, it asks the bank to debit from the customer account the particular price. And what does the bank do? The bank has got a, a list with the balances for each customer. So each customer is uh, uh, mapped to an unsigned uh, integer, and, uh, which is uh, the amount of money that they have in their balance. And uh, they, uh, when, uh, when they receive a, a credit uh, message, then they increment the customer with uh, the amount for the increment uh, uh, message. And uh, I need to do a little bit, uh, uh, I need to be a little bit careful to see whether there is an entry in uh, the balances uh, uh, list, but uh, that's not that interesting. What is interesting is that uh, when uh, uh, the bank receives the credit message, it will increment uh, the balance for the account. When it uh, receives the debit message for the particular uh, uh, balance, uh, sorry, for the particular customer, it will decrement their balance. And uh, there is some uh, checking that uh, the balance should not be smaller than the price for the entity. So it, this situation should not be reached because I'm, f I'm hoping when I am writing the customer uh, function, I'm hoping that I'm never going to run into this error because I'm first uh, asking the bank to credit and then I'm asking the store to buy. So if we look at uh, the execution, we can think that the customer uh, runs his method, asks the bank to credit, then asks the shop to buy, and the, uh, the shop asks the bank to debit, and everything is fine. Can it be that we obtain, the, that uh, the messages are received in that order, that even though the customer first sends credit and then buy, the shop does the buying first? Yes, it can, we just said. But nothing is going to go wrong because the bank is going to run credit and then debit. So this is a possible scenario, and it's OK. But what about this scenario? Uh, can it be that the customer says, uh, run, he sends the credit message, uh, the shop sends, sends the debit message, and even though this was sent uh, before that, this is taken out of the... Um, out of the queue afterwards. So if we received this, if this situation were possible, then we would have a negative uh, balance. Perhaps we would be put into jail. The customer will be put into jail. It's a major disaster. So I need to do something in order to prevent it. So is it possible? And if it's possible, what should I do in order to prevent it? Right, so there is a constraint which is causality. So this um, scenario cannot happen because of the following. Uh, the, the credit uh, method causes uh, buy because uh, it happens before. Uh, it's the same, uh, the customer sends credit and then buy. So credit causes buy, buy causes debit, therefore credit causes debit, and therefore credit will be delivered before debit and we are happy. 
and we don't need to worry. So causality is extremely useful if you want to write this kind of application. It avoids you uh, introducing one more uh, um, protocol to the whole system in order to avoid those situations. So the, well done. But the question is, is it necessary in general? And is it too expensive to implement? So the answer that I would say is it is not always necessary, but it's sometimes necessary. This is an application where it would have been uh, uh, necessary. Um, and it simplifies thinking a lot if you don't have to worry about it. Um, is it expensive to implement? It is not expensive to implement if you are on uh, one uh, node. If you have a distributed system, then it is more expensive to implement. The solution that we adopted for Sebastian's uh, work was to uh, have a tree structure and have the messages go through that tree structure. And that would mean that uh, messages would follow common paths. So uh, you have got the certainty that things will be delivered uh, um, in causal order. Also, the protocols for garbage collection that I'm going to show tomorrow, they require causality. They will require causal message delivery. And uh, several of the protocols that uh, Sebastian developed in his distributed implementation required causal message delivery. So the next thing to talk about is uh, capabilities and atomicity. So there are four uh, novel ingredients. The first is not as novel, but the, the other three are. The first ingredient is that we have reference capabilities which we will call kappa because kappa is the counterpart to k and it's nice and short. So uh, then we have got three operators on, on uh, the capability. We have got the operator that says I have alias the capability, the operator that says I have uh, removed an alias from the capability, I have an alias, I have consumed the capability. And this is a kappa hat to say I took out something out of the capability. And the viewpoint adaptation, kappa r or kappa prime. So first, reference capabilities. The reference capabilities are attached to uh, references, to paths. It is something that the type system assigns to uh, any expression. And it's something that uh, uh, the programmer has to, re to write to g wherever they write types. There are nice uh, um, uh, defaults, so you don't need to write capabilities all over, but uh, uh, they are always there. They are part of any type. And what they express is whether the person or the actor who is holding the particular path, if they, are, if they hold the path with a certain capability, then they are allowed to do what the capability says. And they are also expressing uh, what other paths, uh, uh, local paths that alias the current object, or paths from other actors that alias the, uh, the uh, particular object, whether they are allowed to read or write from the object. So there are six capab capabilities, but I'm only going to write to discuss uh, uh, five of them. As an interesting aside, when we started the discussion, we came up with those four. But um, the way that we described the, uh, the capabilities was uh, slightly different than uh, what I'm going to present you. It was in terms of a matrix of what uh, we forbid others and what we forbid ourselves and what we forbid the global area. So with that matrix, we came up with five. This one turned out to be super important and super useful. I hope we would have discovered it even if we didn't have the matrix. But uh, this one has got only limited uh, usefulness. So I want to, uh, to simplify things, and I want to omit it. Right, so now I am using uh, the way that the morning paper spoke about the capabilities. So the capabilities talk about three things. They talk about what, does the holder, uh, what is the holder allowed to do? What are local aliases allowed to do, and what are global aliases allowed to do? So ISO and REF are saying uh, you are allowed to read and write. You are allowed to do whatever you want. 
Uh, Val and Box say you are only allowed to read, and Tag says you are not allowed to do anything. You are allowed to hold it, you are allowed to know its identity, you are allowed to compare its identity with the identity of others, but you cannot go inside and have a look. You, you, you cannot uh, uh, go any deeper than Tag. Um, now, as to the local aliases, the local aliases of uh, an ISO are not allowed to read and are not allowed to write. So they are not allowed to do anything except uh, uh, hold it, whereas the local aliases of ref, they are allowed to read and write. So I saw, um, I'm going to say, uh, the local aliases of a val, they are not allowed to write, they are only allowed to read, but the local alias of back box, we don't know, they may be allowed uh, other stuff. And uh, the global aliases, what to forbid the global alias from doing? The global aliases must be forbidden everything that the local alias is forbidden. So since here, for ISO, the locals are not allowed to read and write, the globals are not allowed to read and write either. Uh, for uh, REF, uh, the global aliases are also not allowed to read and write, uh, and so on here for the box, the global alias is not allowed to write. So if we think about those, uh, what do they say? This says I'm isolated. I'm, yep? You don't see the difference between this one and this one? OK, 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 perfect. Thank you for asking that. So if we think that uh, this is an actor, uh, and this is another actor, if I have a reference to an object that says it is ISO, uh, I might have another reference that goes some other way, and it uh, comes uh, here. So there are a lot of intermediate objects. Or I might have another reference. This is called x. This is called y. So if this one is I, so then when I'm using X, I'm allowed to read and write. But when I'm using Y, I'm not allowed to read and write. This is the local alias. So X and Y are local aliases. And uh, X and Z is a global alias. So there may be many paths to an object, and each path has its own rights. And uh, if one path has got certain rights, then the other paths should not uh, be uh, treading on the first path's toes. So there's an implicit assumption that X was created first, and then why you Yes, that must have happened this way. Okay, well that, I Thank you. And... Uh, what can we do? We are talking about, uh, we have been talking about the actor paradigm, and what we want to do is send stuff. So the holder of an ISO may send it. So if, uh, if I have got an ISO, then I can give it up and give it to, to him. It will still be an ISO, and it will be safe, because only the holder had the right to, uh, to modify it. If the holder doesn't hold it anymore and gives it up, then uh, everything is safe. Um, the whole, op oops. The holder of RF cannot pass it. We can send a val because a val is globally uh, a value. Uh, he will not modify it. He will not modify it. He will not modify it. But uh, for a box, we don't know, so we cannot send a box uh, because it could be essentially that the box has got a local alias which uh, uh, modifies it. We can think of box as a union type. It's either val or ref, and I don't know. And uh, finally, tag. Tag is something that I'm allowed to send as tag, because I don't have the right to, uh, 
to read or write to it. Anybody who gets it will not have the right to read or write, so it can be safely passed around and we can uh, use the identity of this thing and it's useful. Any questions? If I want to pass a reference, that's very good. If I want to pass a reference, it has to be either isoval or uh, tag. So if I have something that is, uh, uh, if I want to pass something that as an ISO, it must be an ISO. I cannot make it isolated when I don't know it was isolated. The type system doesn't help me uh, with that. But if I want to pass something that is uh, a tag, I can turn all these guys into a tag and then I can pass it. If I want to pass a val, it has to be a val2 because I don't know whether it has got any aliases that are um, uh, 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 box. So um, I'm going to go through that right now, what you just said. So if I have a, an ISO, uh, the local aliases to an ISO, well, they are not allowed to read uh, uh, or write and therefore they can only be tag. If I have got a ref, then the local aliases of an ISO uh, are allowed to read uh, and write. So what can they be? Any suggestions? Uh, if it is, uh, so one suggestion is val. Do I have more suggestions? So if I said uh, val, it would be wrong because the val is very strong. It says, uh, uh, I'm only allowed to read and the others are not allowed to write. So since ref is allowed to write, if I made a val uh, alias, I would break the promise. So, a na sorry, uh, a ref can alias a ref or a box or a tag. And the val, for similar reasons, as we said before, it can alias a val, a box or a tag. A box, we said the box is either uh, val or ref, so that is uh, uh, what uh, uh, we see uh, uh, there. And I should have added ref, I'm very sorry, it, it is missing. So the, the, the box is either a value or a reference, either mutable or immutable or tag. And now I would like you to, if you want, go into this uh, uh, directory and try out which of those assignments are correct or not, or have a little think for two, three minutes and tell me which of those are not type correct. So what I do here is I create uh, uh, variables of type ISO. I call it a ISO, a ISO prime, a ref, a val, a box, a tag. Uh, this is the type of those things, and here to the right, I am using uh, the constructor. So this says, uh, call the constructor with argument three. Here I'm doing to do some recovery in order to create something that is ISO, and I need to write all this stuff in Pony because we said there are no null pointer exceptions. So it means everything needs to be initialized when it is created. But uh, the, uh, what I would like you to concentrate on is which of these assignments are valid and which are invalid. <coughs> the first one is invalid. Why? Yes, the, the ref is allowing itself to read and write. It may have even more aliases that are read and write, and the ISO says, I'm the only one who is reading or writing. So we have broken the promise. The first one is invalid. What about the next one? Why? But now you have got two roots to something that says I'm isolated. So the second one is also invalid. 
and all of them are invalid until I reach the last four, where essentially I'm allowed to assign a ref to a box, a val to, to a box. Right, so now I would like you to eat, look at uh, the following code. It is on, in the fourth uh, directory, and I'm not going to go through it in the interest of time. There is a class uh, uh, person, and uh, he has got uh, an identity and some strength, and he has got, he, when he eats uh, some food, then he takes a bite out of the food, and the food contains calories, and when you take a bite, uh, bite out of the food, you decrease the calories, you divide them by two, and you give up some calories, you return those calories, so you see there is no return uh, statement, uh, it is an expression-oriented language, and uh, in the actor main, we are uh, uh, first creating some food that I call apple with 50 calories. Then I have got uh, uh, a variable pear that has got 160 uh, calories. Then I have two people, Laurie and Jan, with some strength, and then I give them some food to eat. Well, you were created first. <laughs> so uh, the question is, there, is some, there are some type errors here, and you have to think about what are the type errors. And uh, the first hint I'm giving you is, um, please notice that the functions are saying what is, what, uh, what kind of value or what kind of uh, capability they expect to have in order to run. The receiver uh, has to be a ref here, because I'm going and I'm modifying his uh, uh, stuff. Uh, and uh, here, the receiver has to be a box, because uh, that is the default capability. I didn't bother to write it. And if you look at, uh, at this code, something is not correct. The capabilities will be complaining. What will it be? Ah, that's good. What is the capability of, uh, of the, the, uh, sorry, which one? Ah, okay, what is the capability of food here? It is box. This is the default capability. Say it again. Uh, the classes have got, uh, I don't remember, it's ref. So um, let's follow this uh, um, hint. It says the default receiver capabilities box. That means here I'm expecting, I'm saying without having, uh, I'm saying implicitly the receiver has to be box. And box says I'm either val or ref. So uh, I don't know whether somebody thinks they have got a value capability to me. I don't know, therefore, whether somebody expects me not to be modified. And uh, therefore, uh, this uh, 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 assignment is uh, illegal, because here I'm modifying the state which might have a, um, a val uh, um, alias to it. So that makes it illegal, and I have to, run to write ref here. When I write ref here, that goes back to your question. This has to become a ref as well. OK. And then I think we are done. So that's what we have to do. We have to make things more uh, uh, mutable. OK, now let's look at global aliasing. If I have an ISO, its alias is only allowed to be a tag. After all, that was for local aliasing. If I have a ref, it's something that I may modify. If I may modify it, nobody is allowed to, to read it, so it has to be a tag as well. If, if I have a value, what is the global alias allowed to be? Value, but also tag uh, and also box, because the box says, I'm not going to modify it. Somebody else might. So if, if they are not going to modify my value, then it's fine. If I have a box, then it's of the opposite value uh, or box. 
And now what we want to do is look at the code from earlier and, uh, oops, and uh, make uh, uh, Lori and Jan eat concurrently. And again, I'm, please think about what changes would we need to make. Ah, okay, you need to take the one th with the corrected errors, this one. So I think I have given you this version, the earlier version of the code without the type errors corrected, but now I want you to make it concurrent. I want you and Jan to not to have to wait in order to eat. So here is uh, uh, here is uh, the uh, con con um, sequential eating program. Let's see that it compiles. Yes. Okay. So we want to make it concurrent. What will we do? We want Jan and Lori uh, eat concurrently. What should we do? We have to introduce some actors. We have seen no actors so far. So who is going to be an actor? So the, the people are going to be actors. And uh, OK, so let's, let's make this change. So can somebody uh, suggest why I'm getting those errors? It says uh, the assignment uh, person, blah, blah, to Jan is uh, not OK. And here is the assignment. Why is it not OK? So I have assigned an actor to something that I think is ref. Ref allows me to go inside and uh, modify the data. That's not a good idea. So. The, any references to actors have to be tagged because uh, otherwise I would be going, uh, I, I would think of uh, that I can use them um, um, uh, synchronously. So, oops, where is main? So I'll change this to tag. So I'm still getting some errors. Can somebody suggest why I'm getting those errors? So here I am passing to a person uh, something that is food ref. And the type system doesn't like it. And of course, it shouldn't like it because uh, uh, we are not allowed to have a uh, global alias uh, ref. A ref is only allowed to be aliased as tag. When I pass, when I call the method eat and I'm passing uh, the apple, I'm passing it as ref. So suddenly, the two actors, uh, Jan and Lori, would be. Uh, munching away at the same apple, and that is difficult to, to make. So what can I do? Yes, so I can do two things. I can make the apple uh, into another actor, 
so that it can synchronize the, the eating, or I can, ma can make, uh, uh, make sure that I am passing things as uh, ISOs, and this is what I am doing in my example. So first of all, oops, I'm sorry, I have not made all the changes. Please uh, note that uh, uh, the food here is an ISO, otherwise it wouldn't work. So I have defined the food to be an ISO here, the pair is an ISO. This is the way I can make an isolated piece of food. Uh, I, am, uh, uh, I made uh, uh, Lori and Jan to be person uh, tag. Uh, when Lori eats, I have to consume uh, the pair. This is a local variable, so by consuming it, I make sure that there are no uh, local aliases left to it. Uh, when I am uh, passing the apple, which is a field, to Jan, I have to put something else in the field and extract it from the field, and we will see a little bit of it uh, later on. So all this was there in order to introduce the concepts that I'm going to talk about, namely aliasing, unaliasing, and viewpoint adaptation for capabilities. So f the first thing is uh, aliasing. So we said that um, uh, when I am uh, assigning uh, an ISO to an ISO, th should, there should be an I a type error. And uh, when I have uh, um, uh, something that is uh, uh, declared to be an ISO, I'm not allowed to pass it to something that expects uh, an ISO. Yeah? What does that mean? Uh, B means behavior. It is the, the in, uh, that is how we introduce an asynchronous function. So why are those type errors? We have discussed it already, but I'm doing it my once more. This assignment says that uh, uh, whatever uh, 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 um, y is pointing to, x is pointing to it too, so it's not isolated anymore. And in this case, uh, I had a local uh, reference to an uh, apple from uh, the fields of uh, my actor, and then I pass it. I think this is a nice way of indicating uh, sending of messages. So I send a message to the other actor, and I'm passing the apple, and now there are two references to the apple. So we need to do something with the types. And uh, the, now I'm writing some type rules. Can I have a show of hands who has already seen type rules? That's excellent. So I'm thinking that it's double those because nobody wants to say that they have seen. But I'm going to, to say briefly what they mean. This notation means, this notation means that uh, under some declarations, this uh, uh, expression has got a type, and I have put a question mark in order to say I don't know yet what type it has. And what I'm writing above the line is uh, the conditions under which I can make this judgment. So this says, if gamma, if the type declarations tell me that X has got uh, type A with capability kappa, and E has got also type A with capability kappa prime, I want to forget about uh, uh, subtypes here, then the assignment uh, x equal e will have what, uh, uh, what type. This is what we are trying to uh, find out. And similarly, here is the uh, uh, judgment for function call. So here it says, if I call the function m on x with argument e, and here it doesn't matter whether it is a function or a behavior, if uh, X has got uh, some uh, uh, type A with capability kappa, and the method declaration says, sorry, uh, here I didn't know about the kappa. The method declaration in the class of X says that I am expecting the receiver to have uh, um, receiver type kappa, the argument to have kappa prime, and the result to be kappa double prime, then and the uh, expression has got the type B with something else uh, here, then what is going to be the result? So I have put here the questions uh, as to how to do the typing. And um, 
in both cases, what is happening? We are making some aliasing. We are creating a new path to something that exists already through the assignment, x and y point to the same thing, through the method call, both the method inside the object, uh, sorry, inside the method uh, execution and th the calling method now have got references to the same object. So there is this aliasing happening and this aliasing that happens in the operational semantics in the execution is also expressed in the capabilities. This is this uh, exclamation mark. So we need to define the, this operation, uh, uh, make an alias for all the capabilities we have to f so far. So what is the alias of ISO? What is the alias of REF, of VAL, and so on? Any suggestions? So we can start from the right. Oops, OK, I said it. <laughs> Right, starting from the right, if I alias a tag, I'm not making it any better, so it, it's going to stay a tag. And these two, they stay the same, because if you think about what they allow the local uh, aliases and what they forbid the global alias, it's, it's uh, the same. So an alias to a value is a value. Nobody else is, go by, uh, nobody else is going to modify it. By an alias to an ISO, well, as soon as I alias uh, the ISO, I have lost all uh, the rights. I, I keep the rights for myself. I keep the right to be the unique who can uh, read or modify, and uh, the alias to the ISO, therefore, cannot do any of those things and has to be a tag. Yeah? Right, so that is the answer. And now that I have given you these answers and uh, reminding you, oops, I have. So now that I've given you these answers and reminding you of the question, how am I going to give the type to the assignment? Can you suggest what I should put in all these question marks? Yeah? Exactly. Thank you. So. The left-hand side of the assignment, meant, since it's going to become an alias of what the right-hand side of the assignment is, the left-hand side of the assignment, the X, must have a, a type that is the alias of the right-hand side of the assignment. And what I'm returning, I'm leaving open because we'll see some more of what is happening. And uh, here, the, uh, for the method call, as before, uh, Applying the same ideas as earlier, thinking that essentially when I execute the method, I am passing uh, uh, an alias of the receiver and an alias of the argument into the method. What I have is that uh, the method should be expecting uh, an alias of the receiver, an alias of the argument. OK, and uh, it will be returning uh, kappa double prime. So that is now very nice and sound. And we could spend some time making the soundness proof, but it's not very useful because it means that I cannot uh, do anything with ISOs. Since the alias of an ISO is tag, it means uh, whenever I want to work with ISOs, the, the method has to be tag. It doesn't work very well. We need something more. And the something more is the explicit unaliasing capability, which we indicate with this kappa up arrow means the thing goes up or ephemeral type. Ah. <laughs> okay, so consider the execution of uh, this uh, uh, term where we say I recover an ISO uh, and then assign it to a Y, and then the whole thing I assign it to an X. This is uh, legal, and this allows me to pass the value of y to uh, uh, x. So what is happening is I have got uh, uh, um, locally uh, x and y. They may be pointing to, well, they have to point to different a's. And when I make this uh, uh, 
this assignment, the first part that says uh, y equals recover iso a, what it ma does is it makes y point to this new a, which I have made into an iso by saying recover. So this uh, 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 statement makes that. But it also returns this red arrow to, uh, to the A. It returns uh, the contents of Y is liberated. Since I, have, uh, since I have assigned to Y, I can take the contents of Y and do something with it, and it comes out of uh, the assignment. And uh, similarly, when we are doing, uh, when we are executing this uh, 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 term, then we have got, um, the person has got uh, uh, a local reference to an apple. Uh, it was apple iso. And uh, we are consuming it. So when we consume it, we give up our own local reference. We make a new reference to it. And we are giving the consume reference to the argument. So there is, in both cases, so something slightly novel is happening. The assignment returns the original value of the left-hand side. So the assignment here takes, returns me an, a temporary um, anonymous reference to what the left-hand side contained. And uh, consume removes the current alias, but returns it as a, uh, returns it as a temporary value uh, to be used. So both operations, what they do is they remove stable aliases. This is a stable alias. This is a stable alias. Things that are either uh, accessible from the stack or from the heap, and they return a temporary new alias. So we want now to give types to those things. And we, are, we have got the same questions. I need to give, uh, uh, assi assuming uh, um, that X and E have certain types. What is the type of the assignment? What is the type the, of the consume? What is the type of the recovery? And in order to answer this, I need to have uh, uh, an operator that uh, uh, consumes the capability, that says uh, the original capability that you had, take one out of this, uh, uh, take one alias, make it ephemeral, make a temporary, uh, remove whoever uh, you know, remove it, uh, make it not point to that object, and uh, give me a new temporary uh, reference to that object. So we introduce a new capability, I saw ephemeral, and now I have to define uh, what does I saw ephemeral ephemeral mean? Uh, what does ISO ef um, ephemeral alias mean? And what does it mean to unalias ref val box and tag? Any suggestions? So starting again from, oops, sorry. Starting again from the bottom here, by removing one reference, there is no promise of uniqueness. So these things uh, will be uh, idempotent. Ref uh, uh, ephemeral is equal ref, and so on. If I have something ephemeral and I remove uh, one uh, uh, reference to it and I use, give you a new ephemeral reference to it, I have not gained anything. It's the same as was before. and. Uh, uh, if I have an ephemeral ISO and now I make it uh, um, stable, then I have got an ISO. So now the question is, using these uh, uh, operators, how can I give types to, uh, to the assignment to uh, uh, consume and recovery? Excellent, yes. So the assignment will return me an ephemeral uh, version of what I had. And the same happens with the consume. And with recovery, it's a little bit uh, more complicated. Uh, I don't want to go into a lot of uh, detail. Uh, we start with uh, something that had uh, uh, an expression that had type uh, uh, kappa. 
We also need to make sure that the expression only uses sendable variables, doesn't use something, does not use inside uh, uh, something that is ref where it could store something else. So does not uh, have any opportunity to leak st stuff out of this uh, expression. All it can see is ISO, and the ISO will not come out. Uh, val, it cannot modify the val, the tag it cannot assign to. And uh, then what it does is it makes uh, a better version, a more sendable version of what it got in. So if the kappa says I am uh, modifiable, then it makes an ephemeral ISO, since uh, the recover doesn't have any way for the expression to come out. So it is an ephemeral version. And if it is a box or a val, then it makes a val uh, out of it. OK, so this was uh, about unaliasing. And now comes the fourth trick, which is viewpoint adaptation. And viewpoint adaptation is something that uh, Dave Clark and I came across when we worked on ownership types in 2002. But uh, now it is getting much uh, richer than it was at the time. So uh, we are accessing another object's fields. So here I have, for instance, uh, a class B with a field that is F ISO, and I have got a variable, that, sorry, F, so the field F ISO says I'm an ISO, F ref says I'm a ref, blah, blah. Here are local variables, ISO, ref, bulb, box, and so on. If I want to read out of an ISO, and it is ISO, what is it? What am I reading it as? If it is an ISO and I want to read uh, a ref out of it, what should it be? Uh, so this question we are going to answer with uh, viewpoint adaptation. But first, let's think about uh, the question. So the first question is, I have got an expression with a type A kappa. If I read inside the declaration of the class A and I find A prime kappa prime, what is that going to be? And uh, similarly, if I assign into an expression something what uh, capability should it have? Right, so we define uh, an operator, this R operator, which is the viewpoint adaptation operator. And uh, what it does is the following. It says 1 sees 2 as, as a kappa, 2 sees uh, 3 as a kappa prime, and uh, 1 sees uh, 3 as uh, kappa R kappa prime. This is uh, how one would be able to see th three without going directly through two. So here, you can think one is calling a method on two, and two is doing something on three. Whereas here, one is accessing a field and then accessing another field. So the question is, how do we define this viewpoint adaptation operator? Uh, sorry, the first question is, how do we use it? So if I... Uh, if I uh, assign a field into an expression, sorry, if I read a field, then I'm using the viewpoint adaptation. And if I take a field, if I assign a field, then I'm using view viewpoint adaptation with an ephemeral version. So question to whoever pays attention, why do I put this here? Exactly, exactly. Assignment returns the original value. Thank you. So th what assignment does is I had a, an X that points to an object and the object F, so the object S has a field F that points to another object. And uh, now, and I had uh, uh, an expression which is whole execution, and that gives me some other object. This is what I get out of executing E. So if I do the assignment x.f is assigned E, what I do is I make this point uh, there. But now this one is free, and it comes out. This is the result of, uh, uh, of the assignment. I have freed this object for further use, and I have taken one alias away, so it is uh, um, an unaliased version of the original type. 
So now the question is, how do we define these uh, uh, viewpoint adaptation operations? And in order to do that, we need to remind ourselves uh, what are the promises that we have made. So if I have a tag, then as a holder, I am not allowed to do anything. The local alias, we don't know. The global alias, we don't know. We said we are not allowed to read further than tag. So if the receiver is a, a tag and the field is ISO, then it's illegal and it's illegal to So ISO and alias and so on and the field is tag. It is very strict because it says uh, the holder may only read, the local alias may only read, the global alias may only read. So that means all uh, the value is kind of a trump card. If you have a val reference and you read something out of it, everything is val. If you have a val field, then no matter what the reference is, you get a val. So that's very, very nice. And it means value is a strong and deep property. Makes reasoning very easy, makes uh, message passing cheap. If I have an ISO, that is uh, uh, more interesting. An ISO is something that can be sent as mutable. And we have to be more careful with that. So the holder may read and write. The local alias may not read. The global alias uh, may uh, not read or, or write. So in order to think about what should be the viewpoint adaptation on ISO, I want us first to think about what could the ISO point to? And here I have got uh, an ISO that contains a field of type ISO that points to an A, a field of type ref that points to an A and box. And now let's think about some aliases. So I have got aliases that come from outside uh, the ISO and point to the various uh, um, other objects. So this first alias is only allowed to be a tag because uh, uh, this one sees it as I. So this one, if this one moves and goes to another, uh, to, to another um, um, actor, then the other actor might modify this one, might modify this one. Therefore, those two have to be tags. But uh, what about this reference and what about this reference? So what is this one allowed to be? What is this one allowed to be? So this one is allowed to be a val. It's allowed to be a box. Because uh, this one says, I don't know what the others are going to do, but I'm not going to modify it. This reference is not going to modify it. But uh, somebody from, L, from uh, outside could uh, uh, see it as a uh, box as well, as val. Could they see it as ref? They couldn't see it as ref because uh, when this goes, uh, uh, goes to the other actor, then uh, we have got uh, um, an error situation. So. Uh, okay, there are some small stories and th that is, this is only allowed to be uh, tag. What is important is that uh, uh, this one is allowed to be a ref. So there is a difference uh, between does the alias come from, uh, from outside, does the alias com come, is the alias dominated by the ISO. So it's quite interesting that uh, the work on uh, domination that came with ownership types, and uh, Jan was in the first paper, uh, and introduces the, the, which uses domination for other purposes, comes handy uh, here. So it is, it is uh, uh, safe to have, uh, to be able to modify this object from this uh, uh, reference because it all comes from this ISO, and if this ISO goes away, then uh, this reference will uh, go away too. So given all that, uh, what is the value of ISO viewpoint adapted with kappa? So I'm going to show you again the rules that we had. We had that the assignment 
is legal if the right hand side is uh, um, an alias of a kappa. The reading gives me uh, a kappa r or kappa prime, and taking something out gives me uh, the viewpoint adapted version with an alias version. So what does it mean to combine ISO with ISO? What does it com mean to combine ISO with REF? And what does it mean to combine ISO with BOX? We want, when we have done this assignment, when we have combined and we do this kind of assignment, we want to have that, this kind of uh, relationships. Uh, this, these constraints hold. So if I take an ISO and combine it with an ISO, this is an ISO, and I hope that you are a little bit surprised that it is an ISO. So this, uh, combining an ISO with an ISO gives me an ISO, even though I'm not allowed to have uh, to make this reference, uh, to store a stable reference tag. And the reason for that is that after I took it, uh, sorry, after I read it, if I want to store it, I'm going to store it as, uh, um, as an alias. But the interesting thing is that uh, you would say then the same ap applies to ref. If I, uh, if I said that uh, ISO R or ref is uh, ISO, then when I take the alias, it's a tag and it's safe. The reason we are not doing that is uh, this here, because uh, when I'm doing this field assignment and I remove the object, if I remove this object here, it is uh, safe to consider it to be an ISO minus, because there is no other uh, um, path to it. But it's not safe to consider it to be an ISO minus here, because there are paths. So the combination of those two rules makes for it to be a bit peculiar. However, what we realized a year ago is that uh, actually we should have, be, have thought of two operators. One that is viewpoint adaptation, where it says I'm going down in the structure and I read stuff. And the other is extracting viewpoint adaptation, ephemeral viewpoint adaptation, which is what I'm using when I'm reading, when I'm assigning into an object. So. Uh, if we had defined, uh, if we had used this extracting viewpoint adaptation, then we could have made things here more permissive. And it's not only about being more permissive, it's about being more natural. So what I learned for myself is that in those cases, the, um, uh, the operational semantics kind of guides the type system throughout. And uh, with what we had done originally, where we do the viewpoint adaptation and then we take the ephemeral, we were a bit uh, too eager and we lost uh, precision and we lost a nice story. The compiler has got the story as I have presented it uh, earlier. Okay, so here is the whole definition of viewpoint adaptation. Um, and uh, here I'm saying we, we, we managed to prove uh, to have the first version of the soundness proof in December 2014 after we had written the compiler. And I was extremely worried during the time that we didn't have the proof because these things are very subtle. Uh, the proof also uncovered one error in the type system, so it was useful. But the proof is much more complex than I would have liked. And the reason is actually this. When we are making this kind of assignment, we are changing a lot of the paths and the type soundness proof is based on the idea all the paths work well with each other. Um, the proof does not uh, use the guarantees that I'm showing to you later and I'm uh, in my um, quest for simplicity I am hoping to, to be able to develop a simpler uh, better proof. I would also like to add the uh, concept of borrowing. We are currently making a model for generics and I would like to have uh, an approach to generic that is not based on F-bounded polymorphism. Heather is not here. I don't like F-bounded polymorphism. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Borrowing means you give a reference to somebody and you promise not to use it until they give it back to you. And you need to, give to do it a couple of times, of course. Um, 
So I, I, I have got uh, some uh, reference. I can give it to, an, to 20 actors and wait until they give it back to me. They use it only as uh, immutable, and when they give it back to me, it's mutable. You can express it. It's very uh, expensive. It's, it's cumbersome, and it, it you pay for with a garbage collection. Right, so the guarantees of the type system, I, the aim of the type system was in order to, was just to prove absence of data races. But uh, uh, thinking about it and thinking actually about uh, how the type system is used by the garbage collector, we uncovered more guarantees which make it pleasing for me. So the first is we have got no data race. So it says if I have a runtime configuration, runtime configuration is a calligraphic C, and if an actor sees an object as writable, the ISO or REF, but I'm going to call it right here because I don't care anymore. And if another actor, alpha prime, sees uh, that uh, object and it's a different actor, then the, the second actor saw it as tag. What we said about global compatibility. Uh, REF and ISO are globally compatible with uh, a tag. So this is all we want, all we need for data races. But there are more properties. Uh, one is about immutability. It is deep and it's permanent. So if uh, an, an actor sees an object as val, and uh, uh, later on we execute the, uh, the configuration several steps, then whatever was accessible from uh, this uh, object, so I, if I follow the field with the object with fields F1, F2, blah, blah, until Fn, th its value in the configuration C and C prime is going to be the same. So the object is deeply immutable and will remain immutable throughout its lifetime. As soon as one person sees it as val, even though they give up their reference, it's going to be val forever. Uh, the capabilities become weaker with the distance. So I, I start my path, I saw maybe later on it becomes uh, uh, ref at the, po at the end it, it, it will become uh, val tag. So I have got a long path, P and then uh, fields F1, Fn and so on. And uh, in the static type system, therefore I have got a, a lowercase gamma. It should be an uppercase gamma, but I only see it now. So if the static type system thinks that the path with all these fields at the end is a kappa, uh, then the path earlier on without the fields will have capability kappa prime, and kappa prime will be stronger. So I might, uh, uh, um, P might have capability uh, uh, ISO, and PF1 might have capability box, and then val, and so on. And uh, capabilities also become weaker with time. Uh, so if an actor, uh, we have a configuration C prime that comes from C. But uh, in, in the process where we go from C to C prime, an actor does not receive any messages. He may uh, be executing a behavior. He may be modifying the heap. But uh, um, uh, he, he does not receive any new, uh, any new uh, um, objects through messages. If at C prime the actor could see the object at uh, capability uh, kappa, then it could see it. Then uh, uh, it could see it at the original. Sorry. Yes, it could see that the original uh, uh, configuration at C with a stronger capability. So I might see something as ISO, and later on I will see it as REF. But if I see it now, uh, if I see it now as REF, I will not see it later on as ISO. It's REF forever. So the capabilities decrease with the distance and with the time. And the third ca uh, capability is this figment of atomicity which actually follows from uh, the previous one. It says, um, in, I'm in configuration. I have not uh, received any new messages, but I may be executing stuff. And if I see something as uh, uh, 
later on as uh, not as tag, and if the, uh, the, the, cha the contents of some object has changed, then it is I who made the change. So w once I start executing uh, uh, a behavior, it is as if the world has frozen. It is as if nobody else is doing anything. I can finish my behavior, release my data, and then I'm done. But if the, if the other actors are modifying stuff, it doesn't matter to me. I don't see it. And therefore, I can reason about every behavior sequentially beautifully. This, of course, was one of the main uh, design aims in, uh, uh, for Pony. So out of those guarantees, the first guarantee and the last guarantee were absolutely the aim of the system. And the others came as surprises and nice things to have. And I'm wondering whether we can make our proofs of soundness easier by incorporating those into the argument. OK. We're almost done. Yep. Sorry? We're out of time. Ah, I didn't realize it. OK. So uh, very briefly then, uh, with generics, uh, we, what comes as wonderful is all the operators that we thought of earlier, uh, aliasing, unaliasing, viewpoint adaptation, they need to be used and they make sense. So here I have got a, a generic class uh, with a parameter x that doesn't make any uh, requirements. And OK, you can read it afterwards. When I write the types in the generic class, I can apply and I need to apply viewpoint adaptation, unaliasing, and uh, aliasing. So these operators are not just for the capabilities, it's operators on types. Uh, termination, I'm not going to talk about. I'm going to talk about it uh, tomorrow. Uh, there is ongoing work. No, I'm going to talk about all of this tomorrow. So tomorrow I want to talk about garbage collection. I was planning to talk about runtime organization, but probably I will not be able to. And I can stop now. Thank you. Um, Rust is mainly concerned with uh, making sure that uh, things are stored in uh, uh, a lexical scope and they can be removed uh, from the lexical scope. That uh, makes uh, garbage collection super fast and it makes uh, the creation of cyclic uh, structures super difficult. So uh, I, th I think uh, it does do some uh, um, Restriction definitely works with uh, restricting aliasing, but in a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, there is a directory, there, there is a, in, the, uh, in the library, there is a package that does promises, which is similar to futures, and you can chain them. But you have to use the, the, um, the you have to use this package, it's not inbuilt into the language. Yes, if you use that package or you have to program it yourself. We have been discussing with, uh, um, with Sylvan whether it is a good idea to, to, to be using this pattern or whether you should be programming it yourself. Since there are lambdas in the language, it is easy to make, actually. <laughs>